Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. It is my honor to be able to stand before this body this morning. I'm so grateful. I don't take it lightly. We don't have to be able to do this. That's our pastor right there. But it is such a blessing when we are able to be able to stand before the people of God and be able to bring a word. So I'm so grateful to Pastor Gay. Happy Pastor's Appreciation Day to you and to all of our pastors this morning. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm going to be talking about faith. We wouldn't be here this morning if it wasn't for faith. When I awakened this morning, I sat up, threw the covers back, placed my feet in my slippers and got up. Not once did I wonder if the floor was going to be there. I had faith that the floor was there and when I put my feet down, that I would stand on the floor. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said that faith is taking the first step, even when you can't see the staircase. Amen. So this morning, we're gonna have a word of prayer before we get into the word. Gracious God, we come before you this morning thanking you for this opportunity to be able to share a word with your people, a word to lift them, to encourage them. So I pray, God, that you would allow me to decrease and allow the presence of your spirit to rise up in this moment. Father, we pray that your people would be edified, that your name will be glorified, and that the devil will be horrified. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you, Jesus. There was a weekly drama series which many of us watched during the nine seasons on television from 1974 to 1983. The show was entitled The Little House on the Prairie. Uh, many of us are still watching those reruns now but it depicted the many challenges faced by the Ingalls family in their community of Walnut Grove, Minnesota. In this one episode that stands out for me, Charles and Caroline's, Carolyn's adopted son, James, was shot in, a back, in his back during an attempted bank robbery. Doc Baker performed a spinal surgery on James but James slips into a coma. Doc Baker informs the family that James is getting worse and that he is going to die. Naturally, the family is devastated and everyone is struggling with that prognosis in their own way. Everyone seems to have resigned themselves to accept James's demise except for Charles. In faith, Charles prays to God, and there is this assurance that rises up in his heart that James is going to live. Sometimes when you get that word from God, it's like you know that God has given it to you. And it's like, you know, people just can't understand that it is that knowing that gets into your knower. And so that was the case with Charles Ingalls. The only challenge for Charles is no one but him has gotten that word. Sometimes you gotta go it alone. There is this collective attack against Charles for his inability to let go of his faith and to let James die. But he, am I doing something wrong with this mic? but he has this assurance in his heart that was greater and stronger than the facts presented by Doc Baker. Everyone believed that he had become delusional in his stance for James to be healed. In other words, they thought Charles had lost his mind. Uh, and that is where facts and faith I'm sorry, that is where facts 
and truth collide. The fact is that his spine was injured in uh, the shootout at the bank. The fact is that Doc Baker performed a surgery to remove the bullet. The fact is he was getting worse. But the truth is God said you can be healed. The truth is that God said he's not bothered about what the circumstance looks like or the situation looks like. The fact and the truth collided in this moment. Charles makes a decision to take James away. He takes him out into the wilderness and that he might build God an altar as he waits for the miracle to manifest. And oftentimes you remember in scripture, Jesus got away. He went away into the wilderness. Got to get away from all the drama, all the craziness, all the crazy talking. And that's what he did. He went out there and he built an altar. But while he was out there, he had a theophany, an appearance of God in human form, a God encounter, if you will, with an older man who asked him this question. He said, if God doesn't do it, will you still have faith? If God doesn't do it, will you still have faith? His answer was, yes, I will still have faith. Right there was a make or break moment. Uh, of course he wanted his son to be healed, but if God doesn't do it, he says that he will still walk in faith. Somebody said, that's next level faith. Job says of his faith in God, though he slayed me, yet I'm going to trust him. He was confident that if God slayed him, he also had the power to raise him. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. So Charles has completed the altar. He carries his comatose son, James, to the altar in his arms. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning comes down. It flashes. It strikes the altar. It hits Charles and James. And Charles falls to the ground and is not knocked unconscious with his son in his arms. He is awakened by a, dent, a gentle touch of someone stroking his face, and it was his son, James. Miraculously, James is completely healed and completely restored to health. The topic of today's message is unshakable faith unshakable faith. Unshakable is defined as unmovable, unflinching, unwavering, constant, and firm. Remember the old song? Let me drink some water before I try to sing it. <laughs> I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by waters. I shall not be moved. There is something when we stand in that kind of faith. That's unshakable faith. Amen. Glory to God. The Greek word for faith is pistis. And this is, faith is more than just belief. It is a present affirmation of God's existence. It is confidence in his ability to enact change in the world and a certainty that his promises will be fulfilled. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Sometimes you might be faced with situations that appear to be monumental in size. I need the ushers, if you wouldn't mind, to hand out that little seed that I asked before. If you could pass those out to as many people as can, as can have them. They already out? Okay, all right, amen. Justices are on it. Okay, so, but if you have the faith as, the gra as a grain of mustard seed, 
you can say to this mountain, move here to there, and it will move. So are you looking at those mustard seeds? Are you seeing how small they are? That is the only requirement God says, if you got this much, if you got this much, if you're working with this much, then that's enough to move mountains. Think about how much more when faith is increased, how much more we can do. You have to start somewhere. And I want you to see how a small mustard, how small a mustard seed is. But as small as the seed is, it has the capacity to grow to great abundance. Uh, and this is how our faith can grow. And that little seed, it is amazing. And as I, as I was reading about the growth, it grows very rapidly and it grows very abundantly in a short span of time. So it doesn't take long for faith to grow. To grow. Let's look at faith through the circumstances presented in the lives of some biblical characters that we're going to look at. So if you look at Mark 2, 1 through 11, I'm not gonna read all of that. And also the second scripture, we're gonna look at Mark 5, 24 through 34. I'm gonna read that, uh, some of that briefly now. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days when it was a noise abroad that, when it was noise that he was in the house. In straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them and they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the, man, the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And over in Mark 5, 24, it reads, And Jesus went with, with him, Jairus, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, verse 25, which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if they may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And when his disciples said uh, unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked, about, looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Hallelujah. Amen. So in Mark, let's back up to uh, the first chapter of Mark because we see here that we have John. Uh, John is, uh, is in the wilderness. He's crying, prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, and he is baptizing people in the wilderness and he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It was in this setting that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the River Jordan by John, which was his cousin. And as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descends upon him. And a voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
So following this, the spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of the devil. He is victorious over this wilderness experience and he returns to Galilee. It is there that he starts his ministry by preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. This was new for the people to hear a seemingly regular man preaching with such authority. While Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit speaks out and Jesus rebukes that unclean spirit and he casts it out of the man. The people were intrigued, amazed, but yet baffled by him because this was new to them. He was a man that spoke with authority. He cast out devils. He healed the sick. Because of this, his fame began to spread abroad. So as Jesus was making headway throughout all Galilee, he recognized his need to go away from Capernaum so that he can preach and teach and share this message of the gospel of the kingdom with other people. So he leaves that area and he goes. Subsequently, after a short time, he returns. And the scripture says in Mark uh, chapter two, that there were four friends that carried their paralytic friend. He couldn't walk, he was paralyzed. And so in chapter two, we see that Jesus returns home to Capernaum and the word has gotten out around town that Jesus is home. You know, like some of us, when we return home from a trip, the last thing we want to have is a whole lot of people coming over, stopping by, trying to ask you, well, how was the trip? Tell us all about it. I don't know about you. This is what I do when I return home. First of all, I do not turn on the porch light because I don't want nobody to know I'm in there. I like to unpack my suitcase and start putting my things away. I like to eat a meal. I like to take a shower. I like to get ready for bed. And I just want some uninterrupted downtime. No, this was not Jesus. The Bible says when he got to his house, he started preaching to the multitude of people that had gathered in his house. And they also gathered outside of his house as well. But there were these four friends with their paralytic friends who had made five, but these four friends had heard that Jesus, he had heard from other people about the miracles and the things that he'd done. And so they decided, I'm sure they uh, got together and they decided um, that they were going to carry their paralytic friend uh, on his bed to be healed. However, when they arrived at Jesus' house, there were so many people that they couldn't even make it into the entrance of the doorway. Uh, they could have easily said to the friend, hey man, you know, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get healed today. There's just too many people out there, and uh, we came a little too late. Uh, we can't even get into the doorway, perhaps. Let's try this next week. Maybe we'll get here a little, couple of hours early, and we'll be able to get you healed. No, not these friends. Not these friends. These friends were not moved from their pursuit of healing for their friend. They stood in unshakable faith for their friend. I love the simplicity of their faith and their determination for their friend. They heard about the miracles that Jesus had performed for others. They grasped a hold of faith for their friend, and they probably didn't fully understand what they were doing, but they just believed that he would be healed, and that's it. So these are the kinds of friends you need to have. And this is the type of friend you need to be. Okay, here's what they did. Before they arrived at Jesus' house, they came into agreement to take their friend to be healed. Sometimes as believers, when we hear of the plight of our brother or sister, it should compel us to have a great level of compassion and a willingness to come into an agreement of prayer with faith 
and whatever else needs for their deliverance, no matter how long it takes. Sometimes you, you'll hear people say, I'm praying for you. I heard somebody say that when some people say, I'm praying for you, that was the prayer. That's it. They ain't going to never call your name out when they get home. That was your prayer. You need to enjoy that. But that was it. But these four friends, they availed themselves to lift him up and to carry him to Jesus. Sometimes we need to be carried to Jesus. There was physical labor involved. This man didn't have a powered wheelchair. He needed the strength of his friends to carry him on his bed to Jesus. Sometimes, sometimes we have to carry people in our prayers to Jesus. They may not have strength in the moment of their situation, but they need you and I to rise up in faith for them and to pray until the answer comes and to pray until the healing is felt and to pray until their deliverance is made manifest. I'm talking unshakable faith this morning. There was a singing group called the Hollies they sang this song in 1969, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. Uh, these men put their love into action and they carried him, each one holding a corner of his bed. We don't know if he was a heavy person or if he was a thin person. It didn't matter to them. They were willing to do whatever it took for him to receive his healing. They were not discouraged when obstacles presented themselves. They did not call it quits when they arrived at Jesus' house and it was already crowded like a Black Friday shopping crowd at Best Buy trying to get a 75-inch TV for Christmas. You know how that is. It was thick with people. It was thick with people. They were willing to do whatever they needed to do to get their friend healed. They were willing to walk up some steps carrying him. They were willing to make a, a hole in the roof. They were willing to bear the weight of letting him down using some ropes that, so that he would be placed directly in front of Jesus. Somebody says, I want some friends like that. I want some friends like that. I want some friends like that. Ah, uh, yeah, why not be a friend like that? Uh, glory to God. This is what unshakable faith looks like. Now, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 and 1. The thing that you hope for begins to have substance when faith is in the mix. Glory to God, my faith substance causes my hope to be the evidence of things not seen. Our faith is anchored in the character of God. He is the one that answers the prayer. He is holy, he is sovereign, he is all powerful, he is good, he is truthful, and he is faithful. Glory to God. His promises to us are yea and amen. So when we anchor our faith in God and in his word, we know he will do it. Glory, hallelujah. When Jesus saw the faith of these four friends, he spoke forgiveness and healing over the paralytic man. Just imagine if you were in the house with Jesus. You hear some noise over your head. You feel some pieces of clay and towel dropping in your hair. You look up and see a man being lowered down from a hole in the ceiling on a bed with some ropes and four men doing all the lowering. You might say, what in the name of a homeowner's insurance claim is going on? But Jesus, he saw their faith. 
And he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. And he said, rise up, take up your bed and go home. Church, we've got to have unshakable faith in our God. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. These men, these four men, these four friends got together, faith being new to them, they got together on behalf of their friend and took him to Jesus and he was made whole and healed. As we look at another character here, just like the woman with the issue of blood, for 12 years she suffered. Mark 5, 24 through 34. She spent all that she had and was not better, but grew worse. Somebody say desperation. It can be the breeding ground for a miracle. She too heard of the miracles others had received, and she said within herself that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I believe that I will be made whole. And as I was looking at this, I thought of another person that had a condition in um, Second Kings, I believe. I can't remember the chapter right now, but it's the story of Naaman the leper. And when uh, the slave girl had told her master's wife about the prophet that could heal her, that could heal him, Elisha, you know, you go down there and see the prophet. And so he gets all of the stuff together that he's going to give him. And he goes down there, he knocks on the door, and he, in his mind he's rehearsed the scene of him coming out and just, you know, making a, a fuss over him for coming and bringing all these wonderful gifts. Guess what? The prophet didn't come out. He sent a, he sent a messenger out to tell him, go on down to the a River Jordan and dip seven times and he was so pissed. He was so vexed. He, he was not happy. He was offended. But one of his servants told him to go and do that. Well, we see the difference between a person being filled with pride and this woman that was humble because she said within herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. She wasn't the one that said, you know, let me get in the prayer line. Uh, let me get some, uh, I know I like how they put the oil in their hand and then they make a cross on your forehead and then they put their hands on your head. She wasn't worried about any of that. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made whole. So she took action. She knew because of her condition that she was unclean. She knew that she wasn't supposed to be around all those people because she would make them unclean. But when she went into the crown anyway, pressing her way, maybe a little weak from her blood loss, but pressing nonetheless until she reached Jesus and was able to touch the hem of his garment. Jesus said, who touched me? Because he felt the virtue leaving him. Everybody in the crowd didn't have faith as they touched him. They just wanted to be there. Sometimes people just want to see and be seen, but not her. For when she touched the hem of his garment, she was immediately made whole of her condition, and she felt it. She was scared as she came forward and fell at his feet and told him her story. And he said, daughter, your faith made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. As I began to think about all of these, these two characters and the multitude of many others, and many of you, you could have been the example in this story today. But as we talk about unshakable faith is what you need to get God's attention, I'm reminded of years ago in my closing, I had a dear friend, her name um, is Lisa Marie, 
and Lisa was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor the size of an orange in her abdomen. Now, Lisa was like a size four. And so, you know, somebody that small, you can see. And, and she believed God for healing. And she told her doctors that she wanted to travel to healing school uh, held at Raymond Bible College down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She believed that going there that she would get healed uh, because the ministry offered two sessions. It offered the morning session for sick and diseased people and the afternoon session was open to anyone who wanted to learn about how to receive healing. Because of her condition, the airline wouldn't allow her to travel without a release from her doctor. And it also had her to sign a release um, from her so that if something happened to her in, on the flight, that they would not be held uh, liable. And so she traveled, she and her sister traveled to Tulsa. She had to use a scooter to get around because she wasn't steady on her feet. And when she arrived, she witnessed in that morning session, she witnessed all kinds of conditions all around her. Some people were in wheelchairs. Some came on stretchers. Some were on in scooters. Some were walking with canes. Some were being helped, held by others just to get to this place. And there was a woman that was sitting by uh, her with her unbelieving husband who let it be known he didn't really want to believe be there and he didn't believe in all this crazy stuff but he brought his wife because she believed that she would be healed and my friend said uh, this woman had cancer on her face so imagine this half of her face is normal and the other half has been eaten away by cancer so it was really very scary to see one half look normal and the other half just eaten away and so all she could hear this lady say is I just want to get in his presence. I just want to worship him. I just need to get in his presence. And they normally had a format that they kept, but as the pastor got up to open the service on that day, he changed it this time. And he said, he said, I feel the Lord leading me. Let's go another way today. Let's just begin to worship God, and let's just get in the presence of the Lord this morning. And the people began to worship God, and suddenly the whole place was filled with men and women worshiping God together. Suddenly, the glory of the Lord came into that room, and people started falling out under the power of God. They fell out of wheelchairs. They fell off of their seats and they fell off of the stretchers. And after some time, people began yelling out, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And my, my friend said, um, after she had gotten up, she said she looked over and the woman that had the cancerous of face, she had fallen under the power of God. And when her husband went to pick her up, he dropped her because it scared him. Because when he looked at the side of her face that was eaten with cancer, it was completely restored like the other side. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And my friend, she began to feel around her belly for that tumor the size of an orange. And when she got up, she went to the ladies' room and she said, it's gone. Glory to God. The, the tumor, the size of an orange was completely gone. And many people were crying out and many people were worshiping God for receiving their healing. They knew before they got there that they would be receiving healing and they got what they believed for. Just like the four friends with the paralytic friend, the woman with the issue of blood, my sister friend, Lisa Marie, and all of these people believed God as they stood in unshakable faith. They stood against the naysayers. They stood against the, the doubters. They stood against the obstacles. They stood against the prowls. 
They stood against pain and suffering. They stood in unshakable faith until the righteous God, the holy God, the faithful God, the covenant keeping God answered their prayers. He did it for them and he'll do it for you. He is not a God that will not do it in 2024. If you just stand in faith and begin to believe him, God is faithful and he will do what he promised to do. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He calls us. He calls us. He calls us to unshakable faith. He calls us. He calls you. He calls you to unshakable faith. Glory to God. He is faithful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.